Record highs across the board following NVIDIA's Big Beat Live from Studio 2 at Bloomberg headquarters here in New York. I'm Katie Greifel. And I'm Shanali Basak. We're kicking you off to the closing bell here in the United States. And let's get a check on these markets. As Katie was saying, we are at or near record highs for many of these indices. We're watching the S&P 500 now up more than 2%, quickening that pace of that rise there. And the NASDAQ 100 not at a record high, but up nearly 3% on the day. The SOX Semiconductor Index near session highs up more than 5%, hit new record highs today on the heels of those NVIDIA earnings. We'll talk about that a lot today. And the two-year yield also on the rise. Interestingly, there's a bond sell-off a little bit underway here. The two-year yield now holding steady at around 471, Katie. All right, we're going to talk about stocks, we're going to talk about bonds, and we're also going to talk about space because space exploration startup Intuitive Machines will attempt to land the first intact U.S.-made lander on the moon in more than 50 years this evening. Touchdown on the moon surface currently planned for 624 p.m. Eastern. We're going to bring you minute-by-minute minute coverage, but Back here on Earth, we're also going to get a read on real estate with billionaire Barry Sternlicht, who said last month that he sees more than a trillion dollar in losses for office real estate up ahead. We're going to get his thought on who stands to lose the most in a meltdown and also where the opportunities lie. And of course, like we've mentioned, stocks rallying hard on the heels of that NVIDIA report with insatiable demand for its AI accelerator chips, really helping the company blow past expectations. You have NVIDIA shares trading near a record that's boosting the big benchmarks to all-time highs as well. And meanwhile, NVIDIA's performance is also lifting its competitors as well, as investors bet that when it comes to AI chips, the size of the pie it's only growing from here, Shanali. Perhaps we're still going to the moon here, Katie. We're looking at <laughs> NVIDIA here. And I wanted to show you not just what was happening in the spot market, but the options market is also flying high here. Uh, a while ago, really, NVIDIA options worth $800 expiring tomorrow would have looked a little expensive. But with the stock near record highs and on the rise so dramatically, you have to look at the lots that are facing uh, $1,000 strike prices or more. You could see a lot more bullishness still here under the surface as early early KDS tomorrow. All right, let's kick things off today with Liz Ann Saunders. She is chief investment strategist over at Charles Schwab. So Liz Ann, obviously a lot of focus on NVIDIA after an earnings report like we saw last night, but also a lot of focus on the Fed. Of course, we got those FOMC minutes this week. We're getting a lot of Fed speak right now. What is the bigger thing that you're paying attention to this week? Is it the micro, the company level earnings, or are you still keeping an eye on the macro? Well, both. And I think in the case of NVIDIA today, what's interesting is um, uh, leading into today through yesterday's close, specifically from the release of the January CPI report, technology as a sector was actually the worst performer of all sectors. Energy was the best performer of all sectors. Now, a day like today clearly changes that tie, but to see whether there's persistence in what has been not just a leadership shift underway, but a lot of churn under the surface. I mean, the average member drawdown from a year-to-date high for the NASDAQ is actually negative 21%. The index is, is, has only had a drawdown of about 3%. Uh, so there is a lot more going on under the surface. So we'll have to see whether NVIDIA's leadership can kind of carry tech beyond just a, a one-day game. In terms of the, the Fed, uh, the minutes were not terribly surprising. I guess leaned a bit more hawkish, but I think reinforcing what we've been talking about, which is that this is a unique cycle in the sense that, you know, the old adage of the Fed takes the escalator up and the elevator down. They very clearly took the elevator up this time when they were hiking rates. And I think the inclination at this point is until the data supports an actual pivot to cuts, uh, as they think about the start point and how aggressive they want to be, it's more of an escalator approach. Yeah, definitely trying to take the escalator down. I like that a lot. I'm going to steal it. Do you think, though, <laughs> that they're going to have that luxury to be able to time this the way they want? Because you look at the data right now, it appears that you know they can stay on hold. But do you think that we're Heading into a situation where actually we're going to learn that maybe they over tightened? 
Well, there's always that risk because of the long and variable uh, lags, and that's one of the reasons why they, I think, are biased to stay in pause mode right now to assess those long and variable lags. I think what the Fed wants to try to avoid are the fits and starts of monetary policy and the mistakes made during the 70s of, of prematurely declaring victory, loosening policy only to see inflation rear its ugly head again. So I think their bias is to sit tight until at least one, if not both, of their mandates, the inflation side and the labor market side are suggestive of inflation getting to and remaining uh, at their uh, target. And the other interesting thing that happened more so in the 60 Minutes interview that Powell did, not so much the press conference, is he shifted the emphasis to a 12-month change in their preferred Fed you know, metric of, of inflation, the PCE, the core PCE. And they had been in the past more focused on three-month change, six-month change, so that elongation of the, the trend they're looking at is supportive of this idea that they want to make sure that lower inflation is sort of cemented before they pivot to easier policy. It's interesting. On a day like today, you don't see higher interest rates necessarily taking a bite out of markets. And it really begs the question, at what point do higher yields start to do that? Well, you're not seeing it in, a, in an absolute sense take a bite out of the market, but uh, moves in yields have had a disproportionate impact down the cap spectrum. And although the Russell 2000 as a, as a benchmark index for small caps is not down today, it certainly has had weaker performance on a day like today. And it's obviously had weaker performance just in, in general since we saw the recent low in yield. So I think it's where there's more interest rate sensitivity, whether it's just down the cap spectrum broadly or into the non-profitable area in particular, zombie-type companies, companies that don't have cash flows to pay interest coverage, I think that's where the bite is likely to be felt more acutely. So not so much in a monolithic sense, but at the uh, individual stock level, uh, dependent on factors like strength of the balance sheet, how much cash flow you have, and whether you've got uh, the need to uh, roll over uh, corporate debt. Well, it begs the question as well, do you think that, that more companies will start to roll over into distress? If you even look at the way that people are pouring into junk bond markets at this point in time, there has still been a lack of recognition that things could weaken for those sectors that are still sensitive to higher interest rates. Yeah, you know, so far it's been a very tame um, credit part of the, the equation, and credit does tend to be a leading indicator for any problems that start to arise in the equity market. And sometimes, you know, credit problems can erupt fairly swiftly. We haven't seen it in, in anything resembling a blowout in spreads, obviously, but as, as someone on the equity side of things, I'm certainly keeping a close eye on things. For now, it's concentrated among those companies that are, that are most at risk, and it's not spreading more broadly. But uh, I think if you... If if you're out there looking for possible risks within the equity side of things, I think you have to keep your eye not just on, on the yield environment, which we already touched on, but what's going on, uh, particularly down the quality spectrum into, uh, into junk debt. Definitely feels like we're at that point in the cycle where, of course, the equity folks have to pay attention to the credit side and, of course, vice versa. Liz Ann, great conversation as always. That, of course, is Liz Ann Saunders. She is chief investment strategist over at Charles Schwab. Now coming up, we'll speak with Barry Sternlich, CEO of Starwood Capital, and get his insight on what's ahead for the office real estate sector. And something that's been singing a lot of people, our stock of the hour is AT&T. We're going to have the latest on what caused today's major disruption on the company's mobile network. And we'll also get insight on what's ahead for private equity deals in 2024. We'll do that with Anastasia Amoroso, Chief Investment Strategist at iCapital. All that and more coming up. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Real estate investment trust Starwood Property out with earnings this morning, beating estimates on revenue and distributable EPS. And these results come at a time when the office market is on edge about property valuation and the Federal Reserve's path to cutting interest rates. Billionaire investor Barry Sternlicht has warned of more than a trillion dollars of losses lurking in the market, in the office market. We're happy to say Barry Sternlicht joins us now from the FII Priority Miami Conference, and he is the CEO of Starwood Capital Group. Barry, since the last time you spoke publicly about this dynamic, the market's expectations for rate cuts have changed dramatically, and you have more and more investors even thinking that there's a possibility of a rate hike. How do you think of that possibility? 
I don't think we'll see a rate hike. Um, and I, we'll see if January turns out to be a blip in the strength of the economy. I think you have two economies clashing. You have the private economy and the public economy. Um, public being driven by public spending. And whether it's the Infrastructure Bill, the Climate Act, the CHIPS Act, or the leftover money from the America's Recovery Act, there's still a ton of fiscal spending. In the meantime, companies are beginning to hunker down. You're seeing a series of layoffs. I think also the practicality of keeping rates this high. I do think you'll see inflation come down uh, materially uh, towards uh, now, soon. And um, I think because of that, um, the Fed's going to be faced with a decision. It can leave rates where they are. The, the non-capital uh, intensive parts of the, of the economy, which I'll call the Fab 7, they, these companies have great balance sheets. They're, Technology is not necessarily, or heretofore has not necessarily been capital intensive. It is at the moment because many of these companies like Amazon are building out amazing data center infrastructure businesses that are hugely capital intensive. And Microsoft and NVIDIA themselves recently, uh, Meta, Google, all these companies are actually spending money. And that is actually, it's such a race and it's so right now um, that it is um, booing the markets and keeping construction jobs busy. But you have a huge wave of apartments completing, uh, almost a million apartments this year, 70% this year, 30% next year in the first half. And I think it's easy to see over the horizon and see that there'll be almost less than 200,000 uh, apartments being started. So industrial starts have stopped, uh, have fallen 70%. Apartment uh, starts will fall 65, 70%. Uh, housing starts are, st are stalling again because rates are rising. So I do think the economy is softening, and I do think the Fed, particularly Janet Yellen, she's changed her tune recently. You've heard her talk a little about the regional banking market. I think they're worried uh, at the $1.9 trillion of loans these banks are holding, real estate loans, which is up materially since pre-pandemic levels, and valuations are obviously down. So there is a giant skeleton in the closet in the regional banks. I think the Fed is aware of that. And they themselves have a $34 trillion deficit that they have to finance. Right. And they can finance it at 5.3% or Barry. they can finance it at 4 <laughs> Barry, we can get back to the deficit. So it's up second. to them. And, and I, I also want to welcome in our uh, radio audiences as well to this conversation with Barry Stern, like the CEO of Starwood Capital. We we're talking about the opportunity that people have to really put money to work and, and shore up capital in this environment right now. But you have really pointed to the existential crisis in property, in the office market. And now we're seeing even parts of the residential market see some pains as well. Where are those skeletons hiding? Uh, it's not clear exactly. I, I think there are some offshore investors, particularly in Asia, that took uh, junior slices of debt, and they'll be the first to lose money, whether it, um, some of these are in Korea, uh, to some extent Singapore. So there's that. Then there's the pension plans um, that are in the core funds in the United States and individuals um, that may own small properties. Most of the regional banks are lent to smaller operators. And every piece of real estate is worth less when interest rates go up 500 basis points. Now, and no sector of real estate in the United States, uh, other than data centers, are rents really rising rapidly today. So you're in a stall pattern. Uh, foreclosures in January just announced, uh, I just saw it on the, on the wires, are up 17%. So it is a U.S. phenomenon, really, the, the, the issue with office. That is a U.S. situation. Offices are full in Europe, and they're full in Asia, and they're full in the Middle East. I'm at the FAI conference. I can tell you they're all back to work. Americans are not uh, back to work, and that's, that's causing a significant stress on the office markets. Not only that, the markets are about 18 percent vacant. Um, shadow vacancies are like 23. So there's no asset class in real estate in the United States that's in as much strain as the office markets. And there are no lenders. So if you want to sell a building, you can't get financing for the building because all the banks, the commercial banks, the big ones, and the small ones are trying to reduce their exposure to office, which makes you know, lending a very interesting thing, but very hard to buy unless you're a high net worth family just buying a building and putting it away as an unlevered investment in your trust, right. so, uh, which people are doing. And, and in the office markets, you have the really good buildings, which are leased and they're full and then everything else. And the office markets will look a lot like the mall market in the United States where there are great malls that tenants fight to get in, mm -hmm. and then malls that tenants can't wait to get out of because they're, oh, they're going to the abyss. So I think office is also block by block, city by city, and what the quality of the building is. Is it ESG compliant? Is it a leader in its field? And good buildings are, are holding their tenants, and they're full in most every, most every city. And those eventually, I think, capital will come back and finance, and the markets will stabilize. But 
There's a lot of B and C office buildings that just do not have demand today, and we'll have to see. Those losses are spread primarily in the smaller buildings, in the regional banks, in commercial mortgage-backed securities, in um, insurance companies, probably not that bad, because insurance companies never got that aggressive, and maybe they were right. loaning 50, 60 percent. But, uh, and the commercial banks. I think the commercial banks are also nervous about some of their office exposure. Well, Barry, I want to talk about some of your portfolio because, of course, one of your REITs, the Starwood Property Trust, it reported earnings today. And if you take a look at the earnings call, there were some interesting nuggets in there. For example, you had an executive mention two foreclosed buildings, vacant building in L.A., a Houston office tower. They were both in active discussion to be sold. Those deals fell through. What happened there, and what does that say about the current market for property sales? I think I think it's absolutely emblematic of the markets today. Both they were very willing buyers um, at our at an attractive number for us. Basically, we probably lent fifty or sixty percent of original value, um, but the buildings are declined forty percent, and my number of a trillion losses is thirty percent off of off the value, and of course that includes leverage, so it doesn't have to go down that much to lose that much equity. But in that case, you know, that building in L.A., we took, a, uh, I think the original basis was like 400, our loan was like 240, and now we've written it down to $150 million, and it's going to be converted probably to a residential building or maybe even a data center. It's downtown L.A. But I think that is, the buyers can't find financing. They'll, you know, financing, if you're going to borrow, you know, they're going to want... 10%, um, 11% money today, and many buyers just walk and say, I'll just wait for rates to come down, and then they'll come back. So I think you see transaction volumes in the United States have fallen 65 70%, and everybody wants to wait to the second half of this year. So if you don't have to sell today, why would you sell? You're going to get a distressed price. Right. And I think our, our view is the mortgage rate is in good shape. We have a $1.2 billion dollars of liquidity so we can we ourselves will reposition these assets and sell them off in due course and re put the capital back to work in other in other uses but we're you know it's a very good time to be a lender because the banks are pulling back and the regional banks are almost out of business it seems like in real estate mm -hmm. and many of the money center banks and investors are nervous so they want to reduce their exposure not just investors the government's all over them the OCC and the FDIC are looking at them and saying reduce your exposure that's usually a really good time to be an investor and a lender right when everyone else is running away. But the banks, you know, nobody's going to their credit committee at a bank and saying, I have this great office loan today, even if it's a great office loan today. And I'd argue the risk reward of making the right loan to the right tenant in the right city, on the right block, is probably pretty attractive today. So well, we're anxious to go back on offense, but right now we're playing defense. Appreciate the clarity there. And we're up against the clock, but before we let you go, of course, we do want to talk about politics because we're speaking to you. You're coming <laughs> from Miami. You've co-chaired some fundraisers for Nikki Haley. Are you still supporting Haley, and how long do you plan to support her, if so? I, I, think, uh, I think I'm like most of the nation who would like two other candidates. Uh, and, um, you know, I think it's, we don't know what's going to happen, whether um, Biden will make it to the, uh, but primarily because of age and, and some of the politics of, of the situation. I think as business leaders, you know, we think we ought to be more, I'd say we should be making friends first and, and argue later. So regarding China, I think there's so much interest in actually seeing if we can agree we're both better off with peace and, and we can't afford a war. So um, we can fight later. And I think uh, Nikki, um, on several issues, I don't agree with most any politician on everything, um, but I certainly agree with her stand on the Middle East mm. and, um, and Iran and um, and and um, sanctions are required to keep them from from uh, financing the people that want to hurt us uh, here in the United States and the Western world, and, and in fact, um, obviously the democracies in the Middle East. So I'm um, yes, I, I, I we'll see. I mean, I don't think anybody knows what will happen with um, President Trump's legal challenges, mm -hmm. and um, and 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 um, you know, the left part, left side of the Democratic Party is not for me. So. Um, uh, you know, I'm not a socialist. And I, I, the one thing that really makes me angry is calling these people progressives because they're really communists and socialists, and we should just call them communists and socialists. What's progressive about what their policies are? There's no progressive. It's one of the great labeling acts of all time. So I'm not a far left wing, and I think, unfortunately, they've taken too much. Uh, the parties are splintering to the far left and far right, and, and I would love to see a moderate candidates, so would most of America. Half the nation's independent, and I'm in that camp. I'm in the independents.
So I think right. if Barry was the third party candidate, this would be the year. <laughs> All right. Well, Barry, unfortunately, <laughs> we have to leave it there. Really appreciate your time today. I hope to continue this conversation soon. Of course, that is Barry Sternlich, CEO of Starwood Capital. Now, we do want to bring you some breaking news, and that is that the AT&T U.S. mobile network has been restored. That is according to a spokesperson. Remember, uh, hundreds of thousands of wireless subscribers lost service today. That is something that the FBI and the U.S. Department of Homeland Security has begun investigating. What we know now, though, is that the no mobile network has been restored. Of course, we're going to continue to follow this one. You take a look at AT&T shares right now, still down. Two and a half percent, Shanali. And I want to bring you some more breaking news. Philadelphia President, Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker here uh, has said that he's cautioning against cutting interest rates too soon. We may be near the uh, point where the Fed can cut, but it is way too early to say. And uh, he sees the position to see rate decreases this year. But still, again, Katie, too early to tell. All right, a lot of stories to keep an eye on, a lot of news breaking right now. And of course, a lot of news in the AI space as well, because stocks around the world have been swept up in the AI rally today. And that's after NVIDIA's blowout results and forecasts trounced Wall Street estimates. And investors are so taken with NVIDIA's prospects, they're willing to follow the chipmaker's lead when it comes to holdings in smaller companies. One of them is Nano X. Of course, that uses artificial intelligence to read medical in images. And joining us now is Ori Wimfu Aheimer. I hope I said that right, Ori. She, of course, is the chief medical officer over at Nano X. And from just explain for our audience what Nano X does, because I'm sure people outside of the field didn't exactly know much about your company, of course, before the NVIDIA news came in. Uh, well, I would love to. Um, Nanox uh, has medical imaging, both a hardware device, which is the Nanox Arc, and has a, our entire division devoted to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is really the new tool, the new power, the new ability to create a lot of important information and then feed the doctors, feed the clinicians information to help them choose the right uh, direction for their patients. So mm -hmm. we focus our attention on CT images. CT images uh, are performed countless numbers of times in every ER and every imaging center all day long. I'm a radiologist by training. I trained at New York Presbyterian Hospital. The number of CT scans in the last 25 years of my career that have been performed daily across the U.S. and across the world has increased right. dramatically. Mm -hmm. People are getting CTs right and left for many, many different clinical indications. And yet there's a lot of information on those images that never gets to clinical practice. Right. And that's just not right. Patients have chronic medical diseases, and they just don't get diagnosed until it's too late, okay. whereas all that information is present on the images. So we use artificial intelligence to harness that data and present it to the radiologist at the time of reading We're gonna so that they can have a companion mm -hmm. tool to be able to uh, present the information to the clinicians. All right, hang, hang tight just a moment here. We want to bring some breaking news to the audience here, too, because this is a long-awaited IPO. You have Reddit filing for its IPO here, led by Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan, and Bank of America Securities. Of course, Katie, there is no pricing yet on this IPO filing here, but we do have, of course, a, a filing finally here, and also the financial data of this company here as well. We have for the year ended 2023, them making 800, more than $800 million, a jump from the prior year. And a net loss here of about $90 million, narrowing from the year prior, according to the S-1, being filed uh, just moments ago. Again, highly anticipated listening. This is the first step to what has been a highly anticipated roadshow with a lot of banks at the top of that list. Yeah, and like you said, of course, uh, still waiting on details like valuation and size. We didn't get that today, but we did get the revenue details, some of the financial information there. We also know that the ticker will be RDDT, which is uh, very cute. But yeah, like you said, long awaited. This is more than two years after Reddit filed confidential for this IPO. And uh, it's an interesting moment in the IPO market, Shanali, which you know well. Uh, the pipeline, we keep hearing that there is a pipeline there, but a lot of companies have been tepid about coming forward in these market conditions. And of course, this is one step in several, but to finally get this filing is definitely a moment. It's definitely a moment. And you have to imagine the moment also coming when there's a lot of interest in the stock market, a day of record highs. If you are going to file for an IPO, you do it when the market is well in 
the green here. And of course, uh, we will look through all the risk factors for you and get you more on this as well. But certainly a landmark day in the IPO market, long awaited listing. We're going to go back to our guest here, Ari Wimpemeyer, Chief uh, Medical Officer of NanoX. When, when we're thinking about the, the highs that we're seeing, you started talking to us here about the role of AI in, in the medical community in particular here. What do you think is the most undersold aspect of what AI can do to change the game? AI has the ability of taking information on images that is underutilized and presenting them with clear um, ramifications for patient health care. There are a lot of patients that have chronic diseases that they do not know about. Uh, all that information is present on the images. If AI is able to pull that out into a seamless workflow for the radiologist, presenting it as a digital companion tool for the radiologist, such that patients will now be identified earlier in their chronic conditions, such as coronary artery calcium for cardiovascular disease, still the number one killer across the world, even during the COVID pandemic. And if you look at the course of the last two, two, three decades, cardiologists know how to treat cardiovascular disease, but patients are not getting the treatment that they need. They're not being identified. Almost half the patients find out they have cardiovascular disease at their first heart attack. That's not good medicine. We can find these patients decades earlier by just harnessing the power of AI and pulling the details out of imaging they're getting anyways for some other clinical indication. If we treat patients earlier, which cardiologists know how to do, we can keep patients living longer and much healthier. And that's a great way to use AI. We have other products in osteoporosis management, getting patients to identify bone disease much, much earlier, preventing hip fractures and increasing longevity and quality of life of elderly patients. Mm. And we have a recently FDA approved product just last week uh, for fatty liver disease in the context of metabolic associated liver disease. And again, the FDA is all on top of that because there are several medications that are going to be uh, proven uh, clinically viable and FDA certified for that disease process over the coming few months. So there's a lot of work being done in AI and imaging. Um, and I think the key is to make better patient care but at the same time, be seamlessly integrated into the workflow, um, radiologist tool, radiologist assistant, but then the clinicians down the road, the cardiologists, the endocrinologists, the primary care physicians will just do a much better job taking care of patients with all this information at hand. All right, Oreed, unfortunately, we have to leave it there. Really appreciate your time. Of course, that is Oreed Wimp. Fuaheimer. I'm going to practice that one, Ori. Really appreciate your time. She is the Chief Medical Officer at NanoX. Now, we do want to get back to that breaking news that we learned about just a few minutes ago, and that is that the Reddit uh, social media platform, it has filed publicly for a U.S. IPO. Of course, this comes more than two years after they filed confidential confidentially. So let's get more on that right now because joining us now via phone is Bloomberg's Caroline Hyde. And Caroline, we've been waiting for this one for a long time. What do we know so far? Well, thus far, we do understand it's going to be listing on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker RDDT for Reddit Inc. And as you say, it's the F1 filing we've all been bracing ourselves for. Ultimately, they've been disclosing that they still are lost making $90.8 million was their loss in 2023. 2022 was a net loss of $158 million, though. So clearly they're managing to seize that loss. That's why of late we've been hearing of the deals that they've been securing. Remember, there was that recent reporting that for $60 million a year, they're going to be allowing Google to mine some of Reddit's overall data to be able to train some of the AI models that have been used in Gemini. Now, could that be repeated by other companies? Can you see yet other large language models like OpenAI be licensing from Reddit? And could that be a real revenue generator? They have been improving their revenue, in fact. We have seen revenue pick up about 20% year on year versus 2022 to 2023. That's what we understood before this IPO was indeed made public. And remember the banks behind it who are going to be finally a little bit up, mm. more upbeat about potentially this IPO window opening again. Morgan Stanley, Goldman, JP Morgan, Bank of America, some of those that are leading it. Right. They certainly have brought together the whole cast of characters for this IPO in terms of banks. Interestingly, also, Reddit headlines, more coming out. Top 10 customers accounted for 26% of revenue in 2023. And our risk factor here in the S1 filing here, Caroline, is that they have a history of net losses and may not be able to achieve or maintain profitability in the future. Does the market mm -hmm. have an appetite right now to digest companies with that type of concentration risk and losses? 
Well, no, is what many would have said. But ultimately, this is a company that's having to do quite a major down round, if that's the sort of language you're going to use. Remember, this is a company that was valued at $10 billion. They've been advised, we understand, according to people familiar, that it would be about $5 billion in ultimate valuation at the moment. So I do think that what we're seeing at the moment is this narrative that companies do need to be focused on making a profit eventually, do need to show revenue growth at the moment. Perhaps it is a growth at no longer at all costs. It does need to be profitability shown. And that's what we saw with Arm. That's all what we saw with Clavio. And that's why the IPO window kind of slammed shut a little bit towards the end of last year. Carolyn Hyde, host of Bloomberg Technology here, joining us on Breaking News on a long-awaited IPO filing. Should be an interesting roadshow. Today is certainly a record in markets, but we'll see if that holds into this roadshow. Now, we're going to take a closer look at the private investment industry. Our next guest saying, with green shoots emerging, 2024 should be a promising year for PE exit activity. An improving global macro backdrop is boosting confidence in valuations and investor risk appetite. Joining us now is Anastasia Amoroso, Chief Investment Strategist strategist at iCapital. And it's interesting, while that's true for private equity, it's also seemingly true for venture capital. But what about companies that don't make money? Well, it's going to be more challenging for them. And obviously, there is a big degree of selectivity who is going to IPO, who is going to be subject to a deal activity. And it's definitely looking for companies that maybe meet the rule of 40, which is the profit margin and revenue growth rate, or those that have a path to profitability. But the bottom line is I do think the macroeconomic conditions and valuations are improving enough to where I do suspect we'll see more IPO activity as one valve of exits, but also the other just more corporate uh, mergers activity as well. What about this idea of leverage? You know, part of this is coming from the VC world and you're seeing valuations come down to a point I guess that's reasonable. But if you're a P firm and you have all this leverage, is it easier then to sell rather than to go public given the cost of capital is still higher? Yeah, so the private equity firms have been grappling with uh, the cost of leverage, of course, for the last couple of years, but there's a few things they're doing as a result. You know, first of all, they're using less of it. So if you look at the leverage that they're employing in a particular transaction, it used to be 53% or so, now it's closer to the 40% range. So you reduce that in order to better manage your cost of leverage. The other thing I would say, if you look at the leverage market right now, leverage finance market, we have seen some of that deal activity pick up, and the issuance of leverage loans has picked up significantly. The reason being is because spreads have started to compress. So that cost of leverage for those new buyout transactions is actually starting to come down. And then the other valve, you know, that private equity managers have employed, they just pivoted from the traditional leverage buyout transactions at the peak of when the cost of leverage was really high to do more growth equity. And, you know, kind of a fun stat and a fun fact is that last year we saw more deals done in growth equity versus the leverage buyouts for the first time that we have the data going back to 2000. So private equity managers do pivot as the cost of leverage rose. That is a fun fact. I mean, is, do you think that that's a sustainable dynamic or is that just, you know, symptomatic of the environment that we're in? I think that's what had to be done at the very moment. Um, you know, the truth is that both of those strategies are the bread and butter of private equity managers. And you go to one or the other, depending on what the market conditions are. But we talked to a lot of managers who are very much growth focused and they're going to continue to pivot to growth equity. But there are others that look at the more traditional industries. And I think now that the cost of leverage is seemingly declining, I suspect we'll see a bounce back in some of that LBO activity once again. And I'm curious, I mean, when it comes to the private market, of course, some of these companies uh, that these private equity folks are invested in, every once in a while, every couple of months, we get worried again about the refinancing wall that's approaching. I mean, how big of a concern is that still right now? Uh, it is a concern, and we've definitely, we definitely hear about it. Uh, but, but look, you know, this is why I think the private equity exits have to uh, probably be the story of 2024, because as the walls of maturities comes due, as some of the private credit loans have to be paid back, that's when you start potentially exiting out of your positions. And if you look at the whole period right now for the private equity deal, it's extended to about six years, over and above the average, which is about five. So I think that's why we'll likely see more monetization and that could be used to pay down some of that debt that's coming due. I'm so curious about this growth equity part of the equation here. I can see the leverage side of the story, but if you have more private equity firms getting into growth equity, is that kind of keeping a floor on valuations? Is that part of what's helping support the, the market? And is it more expensive than perhaps it otherwise 
would have been for the traditional players to keep being involved. Yeah, there's definitely different tales of different valuation stories. And, you know, for example, if you look at venture, um, you have seen a major correction in late stage venture. And I think that's to your initial point is that people don't really want to take a big risk on unprofitable tech or unprofitable venture. And so that's why you've seen a major valuation correction there that I think is still sort of playing out or at least stabilizing. But what we've seen in private equity, we have seen a valuation correction from about a 12 times multiple EV to be to about uh, 10. But we we have seen that come back around at the tail end of last year. And I think to your point, people are recognizing a more stable economic environment and they're willing to step back in. And by the way, there is a lot of capital that is competing for deals. And not only is it from the dry powder of the private equity firms, but it's also from a lot of institutional investors like sovereign wealth funds that are also on the lookout for those deals. Having said that, private equity multiples are still well below the public equity mark, uh, multiples that have bounced back quite a bit. Well, Anastasia, it's a fascinating topic. We'll have to continue this conversation soon. That, of course, is Anastasia Amoroso, iCapital Chief Investment Strategist. Now, coming up, AT&T customers struggling to get connected and stay connected across the U.S. We'll have more on the massive wireless service outage today and how the government is responding. It's our stock of the hour up next. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Well, AT&T says connectivity is at our core, but wasn't exactly the case today because a massive nationwide disruptive this morning disruption rather this morning sent customers into a tailspin and sent shares falling. AT&T has since restored its mobile network, but you can see it really left a dent in its shares. And here to tell us more about that for our stock of the hour is Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, down two and a half percent today. Yeah, now it's a big move for this stock, a relatively old school uh, telecom stock. And starting off with the good news, what you just mentioned, the U.S. Noble mobile network has been restored just minutes ago, saying that uh, back in the 11 o'clock hour, they said that most of the network had been stored restored. But early this morning, you had all sorts of users taking to social media saying that they couldn't get use their AT&T service. One woman calling it uh, an apocalypse. Some even talking about having issues yesterday. Uh, and then the company came out around 830 saying that there was a problem. Like there's a real timeline aspect to this saying they were going to fix it, but they didn't know what the problem is. So it sort of makes a, a tough fix. So then they brought in different agencies. Uh, CISA was involved. John Kirby made comments earlier today about the FCC being in touch. The FCC then it one point this afternoon said that they were actively investigating. We still don't know what caused this, though, and it's, that's really interesting. So some are speculating that it could be a solar flare. Mm -hmm. uh, you have to wonder, maybe, was there something nefarious going on? Uh, most likely, though, it is a data network. Data networks are engineered via so software, and so it was probably a software glitch. Well, what is the impact for AT&T overall here? Of course, you still see the shares down on the day, even with a, a fix here, and even with all of these agencies you know, being involved and trying to figure out what is going on. The FBI, the Department of Homeland Security. What is the reputational hit to AT&T? Yeah, that's a great question. And so it's interesting that all these different agencies are involved. One reason to think it's not nefarious is the fact that it was not regional. It was in big cities from New York to Houston to Atlanta, right across. But if it had been like a massive regional shutdown, then you might think that it was targeted in some way. Uh, so if we go back to the past, this has happened many times uh, to AT&T, in fact. It's happened to Frontier. But the biggest one is Rogers Communication in Canada. Back in 2022, uh, it shut down Canada's cellular, uh, this communications company, is shut down for two days. So people were without mobile service for that long. So you would think that there would be huge reputational damage. But one lesson, one takeaway from Rogers is that while the stock was down pretty hard that in that particular year, uh, that they really recovered pretty quickly. There was two quarters of elevated churn, and then people just seemed to forget about it. So it's like a, an attention-grabbing chaos headlines, uh, but it will probably pass pretty Shocking. quickly. Shocking. People forget about things in this news cycle. Bloomberg's <laughs> Abigail Doolittle, we thank you for the analysis. Now we're going to talk more about Reddit. The social media platform had filed for a U.S. initial public offering, a long-awaited one, and it seeks to list on the New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol RDDT. And here with the story is Bloomberg's Ryan Gold, who's been following the story for a while now. And the reality of the situation, pretty fascinating here, is that Reddit had been advised to target a $5 billion valuation. You guys had reported back in January. How have the valuation expectations changed for this company, particularly because it's not
not profitable. I think it's a sort of watershed moment almost for venture capital backed tech IPOs. I mean, this is a moment many people have been waiting for. And I think just given where we've sort of seen IPOs go in the past 18 months, particularly in tech, um, people are wanting to temper expectations. I mean, I think it's, it's clear that people are not wanting to get ahead of themselves. We saw Clavio come out uh, last year and sort of has performed pretty well. Um, but really, since then, we haven't seen a tech back, you know, venture capital back tech IPO of scale. Um, Reddit has clearly got a storied history in its journey to, the, to this moment today. So people are probably thinking, well, you know, finally it's happening. And uh, here we are to talk about it. Finally, it's happening, and there are some really interesting pieces in this S1. This caught my eye. Reddit invests some of its excess cash in Bitcoin and Ether, apparently. Uh, it takes Ether as a form of sales payment for some virtual goods, again, according to their S1. I won't ask you about that, Ryan, but I will ask you about the timeline here, because as you referenced, I mean, they filed confidentially two years ago, more than two years ago. Why did this take so long to get this filing that we've seen today? Um, you know, I think for Reddit, their line has very much been that they wanted to be a public company. Uh, they filed, obviously, confidentially. They've been talking to banks for some time. Um, it's probably the case now that the journey to the IPO is being seen more of as a milestone, and they just need to get past it. It no longer needs to be a distraction for those within the company. And so, you know, and I think that the message is clear to, to people who work within Reddit that, you know, we need to just get past this. We need to ensure that we make it as successful as it can be. Uh, and set ourselves up for life as a, you know, as a listed company with all of the responsibilities that that, that comes with. Um, but you know, I think some of the other interesting things about this filing, it's shown that you know the revenue has grown. Um, it's 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 confirmed that you know some of the some of the feedback that has come out in the testing the testing the waters, um, you know, it's it's a positive sign uh, for, for Reddit. All right, Ryan, really appreciate your reporting. Of course, you've been following this for a long time. That is Bloomberg's Ryan Gold. Now coming up on the show, of course, earnings season rolls on with the likes of Brook Bookings, Live Nation, and Block Out with results after the bell. We're going to break down what investors should be on the watch for with Lauren Hill, portfolio manager and senior analyst over at Westwood Management. This is a close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. I'm Katie Greifeld alongside Shanali Bassett. And Katie, I want to bring us more some breaking news here. We have Bobby Jane, the ex-Millennium executive, has sealed agreements for more than $3 billion for his hedge fund launch. And that would bring him on track to raise between 5 and $6 billion to launch with in July. Now, this would be the biggest fund launch since 2018. Remember, this is a fund that has provided fee incentives. And it gave investors that deadline by the end of January to take advantage of those to raise this $3 billion, initial $3 billion here. And it, he it cut his initial fundraising target, remember, from as much as $10 billion. But still, even at this reduced uh, number here, you still have the biggest hedge fund launch expected this year since 2018. Now, I want to check here on the boards as well here, a little check on the markets because we are soaring. We are looking at an S&P 500 that has been hitting records once again today. And the SOC Semiconductor Index as well. We have an S&P now up 2.1% on the day. And the NASDAQ 100 up more than 3% on the day. The SOC Semiconductor Index, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index up more than 5%, Katie. And the two-year yield still above 470, though uh, cooling a little bit in that sell-off when we're looking at two-year yields today. Yeah, and of course, we are digesting earnings, but we're also digesting some Fed speak after Philly Fed President Patrick Harker signaled he is cautious about cutting rates too soon. We caught up with Liz Ann Saunders over at Charles Schwab with her take. The minutes were not terribly surprising. I guess leaned a bit more hawkish, but I think reinforcing what we've been talking about, which is that this is a unique cycle in the sense that, you know, the old adage of the Fed takes the escalator up and the elevator down, they very clearly took the elevator up this time when they were hiking rates. And I think the inclination at this point is until the data supports an actual pivot to cuts, uh, as they think about the start point and how aggressive they want to be, it's more of an escalator approach. Well, let's keep this conversation going now with Lauren Hill, portfolio manager and senior analyst over at Westwood Management. And Lauren, are we entering a post-Fed world? Because coming into this year, we had big expectations for rate cuts. We've since seen those dialed back, of course, helped by the Fed speak. And still, it feels like stocks will find a way to rally almost no matter what. 
Uh, so, um, you know, we definitely think that we're on um, the good side of rate cuts. So we don't know the timing of them, but we expect them later this year. And that should really um, help keep the consumer resilient. Um, we especially think the Fed's going to be um, very sensitive to any increases in the unemployment rate and just very ready to sweep in and give the economy support if needed. And with that in mind, you know, the idea that the Fed is standing by to support, I mean, how do you wrap that into a view on the markets? If you're out there trying to structure a portfolio around that, I mean, how are you thinking about the Fed and that willingness? Uh, yes. So, um, you know, the economy remains quite resilient and strong. So even though um, consumers are becoming very picky and price conscious because of inflation, they continue to spend as long as they are fully employed and um, the employment picture looks very bright, then um, I think the economy is going to remain very, very resilient. Lauren, how do you put this into perspective here? Because on one hand, you do see a strong job market. On the other hand, you see retail numbers really softening just a little bit here and inflation still biting. And so at what point does inflation bite even harder into the consumer wallet at this point? Yes, so um, yes, the consumer um, is feeling that pressure. So we've, um, we started seeing that a couple of years ago with uh, households earning under 50,000 a year. They really changed their spending habits and that effect has melted up um, and is affecting nearly every single um, person in the US economy today. Prices stand about 15% on average higher than they were in 2020. So people are still continuing to buy their top brands, their, their favorite items, um, but they are also seeking bargains, trading down to cheaper goods, uh, going without, and uh, just looking to save in general um, for items that are less essential to them. So. Um, as long as the employment picture remains um, very healthy, then I think we'll be in good shape. As soon as unemployment starts to uh, creep up, I think we are already seeing some signs of distress with the consumer, especially in the credit card data, then I think that can change the picture pretty quickly. Well, it begs the question as well. There are so many people who are looking at this market today and you see the SACS uh, at record highs here. You see the S&P at record highs, driven higher by this love for the semiconductor rally that we're seeing. But a lot of calls here for market breadth to broaden out uh, small cap, mid caps, and perhaps equal weight when you look at the S&P. How do you feel about that trade, given where we are in the cycle? Yes, yeah, so um, I think that um, you know, it really depends on uh, the sector. It really depends on the company. You know, at Westwood, we're bottoms up investors, so we really uh, focus on the fundamentals of the, the companies. And you have to invest very, very carefully um, at this stage of the cycle. So uh, some companies are going to do very well in this kind of environment as we continue to see uh, tech is leading the market higher today. And there's tremendous demand um, and supply is trying to catch up uh, in the um, semi space, uh, especially led by AI. And then there's other areas of the economy where we are continuing to see softness, the consumer is under greater pressure. And so, um, you know, depending on where you're investing, um, it, it changes your perspective on where you want where you want to invest. Well, Lauren, let's get specific here. Let's name some names because I'm looking through your notes. I see Domino's. I see Dollar General. I see Pepsi as some of the stocks that you like right now. What is the common thread between those? Yes. Yeah, so all of those um, are really wonderful for uh, bargain seeking consumers. So taking Domino's Pizza, for example, um, it's the cheapest way to feed a family outside um, the home if you if you're not going to cook that evening. Um, they have this really steady franchisee model um, that's very resilient no matter what the economic backdrop looks like. They've had some great menu innovation, so a lot of their newer items are selling very well. And then they recently did an Uber Eats partnership, uh, which really gives them extra capacity for delivery during peak times so you don't have to wait as long on that pizza. All right, Lauren, uh, great conversation. Really appreciate your time today. That, of course, is Lauren Hill. She is portfolio manager and senior analyst over at Westwood Management. And I like the end of that conversation because we spent so much time, especially this week, talking about tech, talking about semiconductors. But 
there's a lot of great underloved names to be found in this market. Yeah, you could argue that those are the names to be buying because they're the ones that have not already risen. And you know what's interesting? There are so many consumer names that we talk about. You follow this probably better than everybody. <laughs> the, if, if last year was the year of AI, is this really the year of Ozempic? Yeah. Who knows? Yeah, and of course, uh, you layer that onto what she was saying about Domino's Pizza. I mean, it's a great way to feed your family, but with this health care craze, I don't know. We'll see how sustainable that is. Yeah, push-pull in all of these forces. Some using it as a chance to have healthier options, I guess, Katie. Well, you take a look at the markets right now broadly, and we are rallying at record highs and moving closer to the closing bell. Full market coverage right here on Bloomberg as we take you to the bell and beyond. Beyond the Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. All right, about two minutes away from the end of the trading day, Katie Greifeld and Shanali Bassett counting you down to the closing bell. I'm here to help take us beyond the bell with a global simulcast. We're joined now by Carol Masser and Tim Stenovic, bringing together all of our audiences. And Carol, mm. life is good. We're at a record high again. Everything is awesome. I mean, think about the markets around the globe reacting to NVIDIA, and we certainly saw it here in the U.S. trade. Uh, when we look at individual groups, the semiconductors um, have to send thank you cards to NVIDIA <laughs> because the group as a whole up about 5%. Almost every name in the socks is uh, showing some gains today, Tim. Okay, it's tough to find folks who kind of poo poo this but we found one poo -poo, Cole Smead. Is that technical? Yeah it's a technical term. Okay. Cole Smead we just spoke to him over at Smead Capital Management. They're value investors so he's skeptical of the big tech names of NVIDIA but he says you know with with moves like this they see a 30 to 40 percent bear market on the horizon he doesn't know when it's going to happen um but he doesn't think moves like this are healthy yeah the uh, divergence is pretty incredible in the market today because you have so many people ca calling for this widening of breadth in the market this idea of small cap equal weight s p but does that hold up in a market that others believe a drawdown is pending do you guys remember like at the end of last year when we did have this like gorgeous broadening out and the Russell 2000 went straight up into the right and I don't know where we are on that narrative, but it's right back to big tech, Carol. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Just when everybody, don't you feel like you get, you know, very strategists coming on? They're like, no, 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 they've had their run. It's time to broaden out. And then here we are all in again. All in and all in on these uh, equity markets as well. When you take a look at the big benchmarks, what, we're almost 11 seconds away from the closing bell. Let's see how we finish up and like we've been saying it is a big broad day a lot of green on that screen you take a look at the s p 500 at 4 p.m in new york it is going to finish the day over two percent higher we are well above 5,000 at this moment even more so if you take a look at the nasdaq of course the nasdaq finishing almost three percent higher on the day this was a day of big tech after those NVIDIA results, and I don't know, let's look at the Dow Jones just for fun. It also, <laughs> Give it some uh, love. Amazon's going to be in it, right? Yeah, that's, that's true. We will definitely pay more attention to it then, but it also had a good day, finishing about 1.2% higher. All right, quick check on the S&P 500. The split, folks, 366 names to the upside, 136 names actually lows in ground today, and you had one unchanged, guys. You had a lot of love in the sectors as well, Carol. You're looking at almost every major sector in the green on the day. Not surprising on a record day, I guess, but in Information technology, not shockingly, leading the way on those gainers, up more than 4% as a sector in the S&P 500. But led by that, followed by that, is consumer discretionary. So you do see some love broadening out just a little bit. Financials, industrials, healthcare, all got some love as well on a day I might mention with higher yields. All right, guys, do have some earnings still. We're in earnings season still uh, and crossing the Bloomberg booking. Uh, this stock, which closed at a record high in the regular session today, fourth quarter gross bookings, uh, coming in a little bit better than forecast, 30 31.7 billion. The forecast was for 31.3 billion. Fourth quarter revenue overall a little bit better than expected. 478 billion versus the estimate of 4.73. Right now the stock is unchanged. Fourth quarter adjusted EBITDA 1.46 billion. Again a little higher than forecast. The estimate was 1.45 billion. Excuse me. And fourth quarter room night sold 231 million. A little light, you might say. 231.46 million uh, was the forecast. But again, this stock closed at a record high today, you know, kind of the over upward, overall upward trend. But uh, we're seeing maybe some little changes here in the aftermarket. Uh, Glenn Fogel, the company's uh, CEO, uh, saying in a press release that he's confident in the long term growth of leisure travel and the opportunities ahead for our company as we continue our work to deliver a better offering and experience for our supply partners and our travelers. I do want to point out something that he did say in the press release. He said that um, 
the uh, year over year fourth quarter room nights grew nine percent or eleven percent when excluding business associated with Israel, which was significantly impacted by the war. So uh, certainly uh, that having an effect on the company's numbers. All right, booking shares now just down about 2.6% in the aftermarket. Let's go back to some of the individual gainers, if I may. There are a lot to choose from. How to go to NVIDIA in today's session. How could I not uh, top, I believe, ultimately in the S&P 500, uh, in uh, also the NASDAQ 100. Actually, uh, yeah, NVIDIA definitely top among the S&P 500. It was up 16%. So guys, pretty much finishing at its best levels of the session. You know this story. Head to Bloomberg.com if you missed it. Um, but of course, we're just talking about an incredible amount of upside in terms of its market cap. I'm looking at a market cap now that's what about $1.9 trillion, I believe, on this name. But it was all about what they'd said in terms of their outlook and the incredible growth, triple-digit revenue growth again for this company. So that lifted the overall chip space. So AMD popping up among uh, the biggest gainers in the S&P 500 and NASDAQ 100. If you take a look at AMD, also higher in today's session, just pulling it up here. Uh, and you saw that one uh, just up about 10% in today's session. As we said, all the semiconductor names were higher today. One more, two also popping among the biggest gainers in the NASDAQ 100 and S&P 500. Moderna reported fourth quarter revenue that beat analyst expectations by gaining COVID vaccine market share on its rival Pfizer. And you saw Moderna up more than 13%, guys. All right, well, let's look at some of the decliners. I do want to start with AT&T. If you have AT&T service, perhaps Perhaps you're not surprised by the news or the stock movement today. Down 2.4%. The company did say its mobile network has been restored after a widespread hours-long outage that happened today. We should note the FBI and U.S. Department of Homeland Security began investigating why hundreds of thousands of wireless subscribers lost service. Um, it wasn't just customers from, you know, AT&T branded. It was those who used the wireless network also. So other carriers uh, that actually piggyback on the AT&T network also suffering problems as well. <clears throat> <clears throat> Excuse me. Suffered also, some problems with your voice today. Yeah, I am. Um, Rivian <laughs> suffered some problems today. Did you guys see this? The company had its worst day on record since it went public back in 2021. Shares fell 25.5%. Um, this after the company issued a disappointing production forecast and announced another round of job cuts. We covered this late yesterday. Uh, the company expects to build just 57,000 vehicles this year. The average analyst estimate was for more than 80,000 units. And uh, finally, do you want to touch on shares of Etsy? Among the worst performers in the S&P, 500 today. Uh, shares ended up falling uh, five. Is that an eight or a five, guys? That's an 8.4%. 8.4%. All right. I'm going to get my eyes checked. Even through um, those glasses? Yeah, I know. They're really thick and, you know, still have problems. Uh, the e-commerce company's outlook pointed to a uh, slow start for the fiscal year. Uh, Katie, what did... Uh, Yields do. I am so excited to tell you about it. Let's take a look at the bond market where all the action is. You take a look uh, what yields did today. They rose a little bit, a little bit being uh, the key word there. You can see that on the two year yield that up four basis points. Of course, we're getting a lot of Fed speak really pushing back on the idea of, you know, sooner rather than later rate cuts, of course, saying that the fight against inflation, it's not yet over. But then you go down the list and it's pretty quiet there. You can call the 10-year Treasury yield just about unchanged. You did get a little bit of a bid at the long end. Of course, you look at 20-year yields down by three basis points, two basis points on the 30-year yield. Of course, we had a pretty ugly auction in the last couple of days, maybe seeing uh, a bid come in after that or so. Now, I want to bring us some more breaking news on Intuit as well here. We have more earnings coming out of Intuit. We have the adjusted EPS of $9.31, uh, really coming in below what was uh, expected from Wall Street here. The adjusted EPS expected for the year of $16.17 to $16.47, uh, really falling in the lower end of what was estimated of $16.39. They st kept their revenue target the same as well, still seeing up to $16.47. $1.1 billion in revenue for the year. Uh, we are seeing shares now down more than 2.8% post-market as they had missed estimates. Yeah, just looking at the press release real quickly, uh, the company's CEO, Sasan Ghadarzi, uh, said we had another strong quarter as consumers and small businesses continue to rely on Intuit's platform to power their prosperity. We have great momentum innovating across our products. Uh, we're, all, uh, we're well on our way to becoming the trusted assistant that our customers used to fuel their financial success. I feel like that's pretty safe statement. <laughs> yeah, shares unchanged in the after hours right now. Uh, the company sees adjusted earnings per share $9.31 to $9.38. Estimate was for $9.70, so that came in light. Sees revenue 10% to 11%. Uh, and then sees change in Credit Karma revenue, uh, negative 3 to 3%, Katie. 
Yeah, some interesting uh, earnings continuing to come in, of course. We do have Live Nation fourth quarter revenue beating estimates. Fourth quarter revenue came in at $5.84 billion. That is well above the estimate for $4.73 billion. You take a look at fourth quarter adjusted operating income coming in at $116.9 million. That is above the estimate as well. Of course, uh, we're going to parse through these. You can see that the stock initially popped after hours. Now we are falling down 5%. We're going to dig into it. I would imagine, though, that it has to do with that outlook. But uh, continue to follow that one as well. Yeah, fairly big short position. Uh, about almost 9% of the float being shorted on this name, which is little changed on the year. But again, seeing Live Nation guys, uh, as you said, Katie, kicking around, but right now down about 5% here in the aftermarket. All right, that is a wrap. Across platform radio, TV, YouTube, Bloomberg Originals. Guys, have a good evening. We will see everybody again beyond the bell tomorrow. Same time, same place. All right, now coming up, more market analysis from Cole Smead, CEO and portfolio manager over at Smead Capital Management. This is The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Shanali Basik alongside Katie Greifeld. I want to recap some of the big things that were happening in this market today because there was a lot going on under the surface. And NVIDIA really took the cake here because you saw the market cap soar past $1.9 trillion. And let me show you just how much that was of a gain. You had NVIDIA's market cap additions really soaring past $230 billion. By the end of the day, it was $270 billion more on the day alone. And remember, the last time we saw a game that big was when Meta had that one day move where 196 billion were added. So you're getting almost 100 billion dollar more than the last time we saw a market cap move of that magnitude. Now, what was happening today was not just Nvidia. We had other things going on as well. We had the Nasdaq 100 also floating higher on the day, not hitting the same kinds of records as the Sox or the S&P 500, but a lot of questions now about valuations. And let me tell you why. Because the story the story was not just in the stock market, it was also in the bond market. You saw the two-year yield really floating higher on the day, a little bit of a bond sell-off off of strong economic data this morning. And you had it hanging out at the highest levels of the year at more than 471 on the day, ending closer to 470 on the day, actually back to 471. We will see, Katie, where another day goes. We certainly will see. Uh, but before we get there, of course, we do have some more breaking earnings. This from Block, the fourth quarter adjusted EPS missed estimates. It sees its 2024 adjusted EBITDA at least $2.63 million. It had seen $2.4 million. 2024 adjusted EBITDA, again, $2.63 million. It had seen $2.4 billion. So really a big boost to the outlook there. And you can see that big boost to shares after hours, currently up about 7.6% or so. Of course, we're waffling around there. But again, a big boost to the outlook, a big boost to shares. But let's Let's go from the micro back to the eco data that we got this morning because existing home sales increased 3.1% from a month earlier. That is the hottest pace since August, but still well below what was seen in the years leading up to the pandemic. Our next guest remains bullish on the U.S. home builders. And here in studio with us, I'm pleased to say, is Cole Smead, CEO and portfolio manager over at Smead Capital Management. So you like home builders. I feel like a lot of people have liked home builders for a while now. Yeah, it comes down to the supply. In other words, the whole idea was that affordability was going to drive housing because it's pretty lo logical and rational to think, gosh, if the, if the cost of money goes up, who's going to want to buy a house? And reality is that that has not driven the housing market because, you know, I'm, I think I bought my first home when I was uh, in 2010. I was like one of those young millennials. Yeah. I had kids early. I was weird, right? <laughs> um, but I say that because back when the cost of money was low and homes were cheap, none of those really smart, logical creatures also bought homes back then. Yeah. So now we're in this world where people are admittedly going to have to pay 6 or 7% or more um, to go get a house. And what we're finding out is that doesn't hurt housing and it doesn't change the scarcity of housing, which means, like, I think a toll reported, uh, you know, two days ago, and their numbers were really strong. And I think you're just going to continue to see this scarcity of housing drives marginally more activity 
but the real game changer will be buyers waking up saying, I'm ne we're never going back to 5%. I just got to deal with seven and fix my, my rent because rent costs are not fun to deal with. Yeah, so you're talking to me right now because I would really like to buy a home, but those mortgage rates are pretty scary. And then, you know, you weigh out the monthly costs versus rent, but that's a whole different conversation. It is, but I'll add one more thing. Millennials figured out that when the government comes in during the pandemic and says you can't have a party at your apartment complex, what did they all do? They said, hey, I want to throw a party in my backyard. I better buy a house. And they yeah. did. And that's a market change from the past. I guess I need a little more convincing on the housing market here. Yeah. Because what, the economy is strong. We saw good Correct. labor data today. But what if that starts to soften? We've been getting a lot of announcements on layoffs. Can this kind of affordability issue become a bigger affordability issue pretty soon? Well, so let's go back to where housing had its worst time. Uh, its worst time was 07 to 09. And then we went to the lowest number of home builds in 2011 we've really ever seen in modern American history. That started out with the largest supply available that we ever had. So the real danger in here is supply growing massively suddenly, which as you can see from you know, the new housing starts, yeah, they've ticked up from their low. They're still very low compared to the last few years like we've seen. And available homes for sale, and we're still bumping along the lowest numbers of all time. That's how housing gets troubled. Um, to your point, Sonali, um, we thought that raising Fed funds rates was going to cause housing to get crushed. We thought that was going to affect the labor market. We thought that was going to affect the economy. And the economy and the consumer and the labor market chugs along. The real problem in many cases is the strength of the economy is causing ultimately long-term problems for the Fed and thus for asset prices, I would argue. So what does this mean for how you pick your bets in the market today? You yeah. know, we're sitting on a day talking about some of the beaten down sectors yeah. at a time where we're seeing big tech flying. Yeah. And you can make an argument here that big tech has been isolated from yeah. a lot of these rate hiking issues that we have seen hit places like housing, right? Correct. And so how do you then convince somebody to get out of what the herd has been following into some of the beaten down sectors? Well, I, I really like the chart you actually had up showing the largest market cap increases. I think you had the 10 biggest. If you go down that list, I was looking at it while you were up there. Uh, Microsoft was on there in March of 2000, okay? Those come with the top of markets, not the beginning of a great bull market, okay? And so it's like, to your point, it's so exciting what's going on in the stock market. But you guys have really fun things to report on, like a big market cap increase. We are having fun. It's really fun. <laughs> the problem is, how do you make money? And that's the two different things. So I look at this, to your point, not only has it been concentrated in these fun tech names, the market's carried higher, really, on that in the back of 2023. The breadth across the market hasn't been that good. Mm. It's a very narrow group of companies. Just to throw out a little number, if you took old tech together, Let's say we took the consumer discretionary names that used to be tech and put them back into tech. We do that with communication services. Tech is at 45% of the market. It was 28 at the height of the dot-com bubble. These things, no one's ever worried about them at the top of markets, right? Because everything feels so good. And then you wake up two or three years later, and everything wasn't so good. But we find that out later. I should have printed this out and held it up to the camera because you also write in your notes, Tech looks stupid, yeah. which I feel like is a very blunt way to say uh, just what you're talking about here. But I also want to talk about non-U.S. equities, yeah. because I also see here that you think that non-U.S. markets will do better. And I feel like I've heard that before, and sure. I keep hearing it, and it never quite happens. Why is this time different? Well, it, it just money's going to go where it's treated the best. Okay, so if you go out and say, where can I buy the most free cash flow, or where can I get, let's say you're an income investor, you can look for more attractive dividend yields. Here's, here, let's use banking as a picture of this. Were there runs on European banks last spring? No. And by the way, the Europeans know how to do a lot of stupid things in banking, and they, even they couldn't screw that up. Mm. Well, it's because we sit in the euphoria here. We are the deepest, most popular way for people to gamble in securities markets in the world, and the problem is that did affect the banks here. Go, go look at you know, Unicredit, for example, who we own. They've made wonderful money. The banking run didn't bother them. They're at all-time highs. So isn't it interesting that people, you can go to places like that, European banking, that no one thought you could make money in. You're making great money. And to your point, I go to a cocktail party around here, no one's going to be like, hey, I saw Unicredit and made a new high. They don't care because yeah. it's not NVIDIA. It's not a trillion dollar market cap. The question is, can you make money agreeing with everyone else? Right. Historically, that's a poor way.
Paul, we have to leave it there. That's Cole Smead, CEO and Portfolio Manager at Smead Capital Management. Now I want to bring you some more results. We have Carvana coming out after the bell, of course. It's a highly watched stock by a lot of the asset management industry. We have Carvana revenue missing estimates for Wall Street. However, we do have adjusted EBITDA seen to be significantly above $100 million. So on the adjusted EBITDA basis, you do have them beating the expectations of most of the street. You have the stock soaring, more than 19% uh, post-market, fluctuating between 18 and 20% or so. We'll keep an eye on those numbers for you. But again, the outlook here is what people are chewing on. Yeah, fascinating story there. Carvana shares, I will note, over the past year up 420%. I had to check that a few times, of course, adding to that after hours. But coming up on this program, the first U.S. moon landing in decades is scheduled to happen later today following last week's successful launch. We'll speak with Chad Anderson, founder and managing partner of Space Capital, up next. This is Bloomberg. Well, the first U.S. moon landing in decades is scheduled to happen later today. Intuitive Machines launched its lunar lander last week aboard a SpaceX rocket beginning an eight-day voyage to the moon. The lander is part of a NASA program designed to jumpstart the so-called lunar economy. And joining us now to break it down is Chad Anderson. He is founder and managing partner of Space Capital. And Chad, so if this is successful, of course, this would be the first time that a private sector company has put a lander on the moon in one piece. Talk to us about the significance of that, if successful. Yeah, that's right. They're going for the title. Um, so the, today is a pretty um, exciting day. We'll see. Um, and uh, this will also be the first time that the U.S. has uh, gone to the moon in the last 50 years. So um, this is a, something of a resurgence. Um, also, these are robotic precursor missions. Like this set of contracts that NASA is working, trying to be a customer of many customers on a uh, lunar lander platform, um, is um, an innovative way for them to get a low-cost ride to the moon. And these are meant to do the robotic precursor sort of things, scouting, making sure that they can land, delivering early payloads, um, scouting out for the best place to set up shop, because these are precursor missions to the Artemis crew missions that are coming next. And Chad, so one of the size and scopes here is that if successful, this will be the first spacecraft to gently land on the moon since 1972. We're talking about a 50 year plus gap there. Why do you think that it's taken this long? Yeah, and gently is um, the key word there. Right. So we've had lots of attempts and there's you know been a couple of attempts already this year and there's several more queued up for the rest of this year. But the ability, and this is commercial and government um, attempts to land on the moon. I mean, it's, it is a very difficult thing to do. I think the hit rate is 50%. So, um, and, and that's again, across commercial and government. So um, this is a very difficult thing to do. And I think that, that the bar actually is set here pretty low. Uh, what NASA wants to see is, you know, can they do it? They've got cameras on board. Actually, a lot of the payloads that, that NASA is sending is there to monitor their progress to see you know if they're able to do this and to get that from different you know cameras and 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 different angles mm -hmm. to to um to, to prove it can you kind of walk us through here chad on what has made this such a hard endeavor for so many to follow through on well for so long it's actually been incredibly expensive so um you know a lot has happened in a short amount of time. Before SpaceX, you know, a little over 10 years ago, the market was very limited. There was a handful of defense contractors on the, the supply side, and really the, the government is the sole customer on the demand side of the market. So very limited market. The barriers to entry were very high. This kept any new entrance and innovation out, which is actually why, you know, after Apollo, um, and after the U.S. won the space race, there wasn't really a lot of motivation to keep innovating and keep pushing forward. So, you know, there was actually this period of cost plus contracts where defense contractors actually got paid more if they dragged the contracts out, you know, if they went over time and over budget. So um, this didn't really do a lot to stimulate innovation until SpaceX came along. SpaceX removed those barriers to entry. They brought the cost of launch way down, um, access to orbit way up. 
And so we have now seen, you know, from a starting point of almost zero private activity mm -hmm. in space, we've now seen 2,000 companies raise $300 billion over the last 10 years. So um, we now have new players coming in and trying new things and different approaches, um, leveraging interesting technology to do what we had done before, but in a low cost way and aiming to right. do it in a sustainable way where Chad, we can stay there for a long period of time. Can you kind of explain what has changed about the technology itself to make this more possible and bring the costs down? Yeah, I mean, well, so the interesting thing is actually, so before, everyone was very risk averse. When the cost is so high to get to orbit, everyone is very risk averse. So you're not using today's cutting edge technology. Um, it would actually have to have space heritage, right? So it would have had to have flown on a previous mission. And these missions were 10, 15, 20 years long. So, I mean, we had mainframes orbiting Earth. We had a lot of very archaic technology that we were using to go to space. So, I mean, actually just using off-the-shelf product, right, the, the technology that continued to advance here terrestrially on Earth, applying those advances to the space domain is actually um, a, a, a order of magnitude improvement. Mm. Um, so, so it's not that, that the space technology we're using today is actually so much more advanced, it's that we're actually using the advanced technology that we had here on Earth. Um, to further advance our space ambitions. Right. Well, Chad, uh, really appreciate your time, your insight, of course, on this very potentially historic day. That is Chad Anderson, Space Capital founder and managing partner. And of course, back here on Earth, we do have uh, some earnings that we're taking a look at. You can see the board there. You have Carvana and Block absolutely flying right now. Can't say the same for Live Nation. Much more ahead. This is Bloomberg. Let's get back to markets and earnings. Booking Holdings just out with their results. And here to help walk us through it all is Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Well, overall, they did put up a solid quarter, Chanel. Last I looked, the stock was down about 1% in the after hours. Mainly, they beat most metrics, gross bookings, revenue, uh, marketing expense uh, came in a little bit lighter, so that counts as a beat. But the one area that did not beat, and importantly, gross bookings, I should mention, $31.7 billion. That's a lot of money, clearly, I spent on travel, versus the estimate of uh, 30 $1.3 billion, so 16% year-over-year growth. But we did see the room night uh, miss. So room night sold came in at $231 million. The estimate had been $231.46 million. They are talking about the war in Israel hurting uh, travel during the holiday really weighing. As for the stock, though, not a lot weighing on it outside of a little bit right now in the after hours. Take a look at this chart over the last uh, year, really flying high, up 61%. So one of these internet stocks uh, that has done well. But it's not just the space, uh, the OTA space, the online travel agent space, because if we compare booking over the last three years to some of its competitors, Airbnb, clearly not perfect, uh, but Expedia, you can see uh, the outperformance is really still there. Also important to mention that they did declare uh, an eight dollar and seventy five cents uh, sh per share dividend. So lots of good stuff for booking. It'll be interesting to see how it trades tomorrow after all of this is digested, but I think, Katie, that those comments about the war in Israel hurting some of the room reservations, I think that that's putting a little bit of a damper on the stock. Yeah, absolutely. Take a look at the stock right now. It's currently lower by about 4.5%. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Let's stay on travel for a little bit longer here because travel and leisure up over 10% over the last two days. That's after delivering a strong earnings report. And joining us now from Orlando is the company's president and CEO, Michael Brown. So, Michael, talk us through what was behind that strength that we've seen, also that upgrade to the outlook. What is driving that? Well, really, when you combine two key pillars, uh, continued strong demand for leisure travel with internally real, real good organic execution against our business, what you end up with is 6% bottom line growth, 26% EPS growth. And in the process of doing that, we were able to return 15% of our market cap through dividends and share repurchases. So it all centers around leisure travel, and we're 90% based in North America and 100% based centered around uh, leisure travel. 
And that's really interesting, the fact that leisure travel remains so strong, because to situate this conversation in the economic backdrop, we know that inflation still high, still sticky. And when it comes to a lot of the retailers uh, towing the line and reporting earnings, you know, the the topic of how much pricing power do they have left continues to come up. But when it comes to travel, it seems like there's still budget to do that and the desire to do that, Michael. Well, I think that's the case. Uh, there's, I've been in this business for, for nearly 30 years, and leisure travel demand really never subsides dramatically. What you tend to get is a rotation of how people travel. And what we saw last year is people checked off some bucket list items from post-pandemic, things they haven't done in a long time, go to Europe, go on a cruise. I'd expect in 2024, you're going to see a lot more U.S. travel, people returning to their normal patterns, 300 miles away from home, drive to beach destinations. Uh, that's what I think is going to happen this year. But people adjust to what's going on in the macro economy. And, and in our case, uh, that means more regional travel for our U.S. resorts. What would it take for some of this demand to start to cool? I think there's been a lot of question about how long it would take from some of this pent up demand after the COVID-19 pandemic to, to really start to wane. Well, I, I think you have to look over a three year period. 2022 was unquestionably a hot year. And as I just mentioned, it rotated the type of travel last year. Our bookings in 2024 are 5% higher than they were in 2023. Um, but it, it's still a little bit off of what it was from that revenge travel in 2022. The point being, though, is that leisure travel, and we saw it uh, as coming out of COVID, is it's not discretionary for people. People are going to have their time away. They're going to have their time with the family. Um, it's just how they're going to travel. So um, increased or can, persistent inflation uh, definitely dampens the mood. But we've seen over the past six months, nine months, that inflation risk coming down. And as we saw in the University of Michigan study, consumer sentiment study in January, it's at an all-time high uh, since, not all-time high, since June of, of 2021. So the consumer still wants to get away and have some fun during their breaks. What does it mean for remote work to then dovetail with the ability for people to travel? It's interesting because you are still seeing some of it four days a week or so, more employers discussing five days a week. Does that right. put a dent in those three-day regional weekends of travel? It's a great question. And in, in the corporate paradigm of five days in the office, uh, we see we see no no real change happening. Yes, there's a lot of pressure to get back in the office, but believe it or not, our length of stay bookings for 2024 are even higher than 2023. So you mentioned it. We're here in Orlando for an associate to leave on a Thursday night, get to one of the great beach destinations in Florida and work from one of our apartments or a condo. Um, it just makes the work environment better. They're still productive. They just happen to be on vacation uh, a little bit longer in a, or in a position to enjoy their weekend more. Like I said, that, that length of stay is clearly up from post-pandemic times or post-pandemic, uh, post and we see no signs of it waning. It's good for our business. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I could see how that would be definitely accretive to your business. Let's talk about how you build on that. Let's talk about expansion sure. plans. I know that you've recently, of course, added Sports Illustrated Resorts to your portfolio. What else do you have in the works? Well, we, we not only have it in the works, but uh, we plan on closing in the month of March uh, the acquisition of a core vacation club, which uh, is a resort system of 24 resorts and 30,000 members in South Pacific. Uh, to affiliate as travel and leisure with a world-class hospitality brand like Accor. It allows us to move into the upper upscale space, um, adding to three other great brands being Wyndham, Margaritaville, and Sports Illustrated. That puts us with more presence in Asia Pacific. Mm. But as I mentioned, the Sports Illustrated brand uh, really centers around what we are focused on, which is United States travel. And we've announced our first resort in Sports Illustrated in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, associated with the University of Alabama. That is really interesting. Again, thinking about that geographic footprint focused on the U.S. because we were talking about, you know, beachside vacation travel, uh, combining those two. But talk to us a little bit about the wisdom of centering this in a place like Alabama, focusing on universities. What do you see as sort of the proposition there? Well, 
First of all, one of the great reasons we're in the United States is regulation in our business is very important and it's great. Um, the hospitality names, the ones I mentioned, Margaritaville, Sports Illustrated, Wyndham, Accor, uh, have great U.S. presence. The reason for us, though, for Sports Illustrated and the University of Alabama, the number one cover of any college on Sports Illustrated magazine, the University of Alabama. It not only has a great sports program, but it's got an incredibly passionate alumni base. And although people like to talk about this as, you know, football weekend, every university of size has year-round events from alumni events academically to sports programs that stretch across the winter and the spring. So the reception that we've, re we've received, not only in Tuscaloosa has been phenomenal, but it's really prompted a number of other universities to contact us, which we look forward to announcing our expansion plans in 2024. Well, how many more can you add to that degree? I mean, if you think about the reasons you partnered with these groups here, who else can you partner with and how quickly? Well, there's there's over 200 Division I universities, but the reality is for this type of product, you're really looking at primarily the Power Five conferences. Um, so, you know, there's about 15 in each of those conferences. Our expectation is always deliver or get, uh, operational execution, deliver results, prove your model, and then grow from there. I would expect we'd announce probably two or three this year. And then as the years progress and as the vacation club and hotel takes takes hold, we'll, we'll um, uh, increase the rate of expansion. Michael Brown, president and CEO of Travel Plus Leisure. Thank you so much for your time. Now, Katie, uh, when I think about traveling as well, I mean, I took the day off just to hang out in New York yesterday. Yeah. And so I get the regional vibe that he's talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I love the comments on combining remote work with vacation travel. I mean, it makes sense of that, you know, you work remotely on a Friday. Why not also post up at a hotel and then enjoy your weekend there? Big, big questions, though, on whether employers will still let that happen. That five day a week looming over everyone's head is still a massive question. Let's keep the economy going, guys. <laughs> Let's exactly. keep those four days in office a reality. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how that fares. But coming up tomorrow, speaking of travel, I'll be speaking with the president and CEO of Booking Holdings, Glenn Fogel. That's at at 10.30 a.m. New York tomorrow. Of course, booking reporting earnings shares down pretty significantly after hours to the tune of about 4%, Shanali. And Katie, I want to take a look at how markets closed on the day because we had a rally on our hands to record levels. The S&P 500 rallying 2.1% to close above 50.87 on the day. You have the two-year yield also still floating higher, the 10-year yield as well, uh, just barely though at 432 on the day and uh, 471 on that two-year. The U.S. dollar cooled just a little bit, barely flat on the day crude up six tenths of one percent but really it was a big stock story now stick with us this is the close on bloomberg We're going to turn back to those results from Live Nation. Fourth quarter revenue beat street estimates coming in at $5.8 billion. The parent company behind Ticketmaster is also looking forward to a healthy 2024 for concerts and live events, but the shares not showing the love. We're going to recap the report with John Healy, managing director at North Coast Research. He does have a buy rating on the shares. Now, when you look at the muted reaction that Live Nation is getting, are they just not giving investors what they want to see? Well, let's think about where we started the year and where we ended the year with Live Nation. This was a company that consistently beat numbers as we move throughout the, the calendar year. Q2 and Q3 are the big quarters for concert going season, if you will. Um, those are behind us. So we got a fourth quarter that I would call is relatively in line. Um, I think their AOI estimate for the quarter, I think the street was like 115. They came in at 116. So essentially not too far off. I think the other items in the release that we were paying it close attention to would be the deferred revenue number. Um, that was up 8%. Maybe investors wanted to see something close to 10%. But by and large, I looked at the fourth quarter results that just came out a few moments ago. Um, didn't surprise me. Um, I, I think most of the results were, were relatively in line with what is a seasonally slow period um, of the business. And when we look to kind of the commentary ahead of the call, the commentary I thought was quite 
um, quite a bit. You know, company is looking for double-digit AOI growth on top of 2023 numbers, which were record for the company. So I think they're they're telling the investment community 2023 was a record year with you know Beyonce and Taylor Swift and some other mega events that happened. But we can continue to uh, outperform and and to. Uh, comp on top of that. So I, I look at these numbers as actually pretty good. I'm glad you mentioned Beyonce and Taylor Swift. I mean, how much do you need uh, that kind of stardom to draw people out into a concert these days? Yeah, I, I think when you look at Live Nation's business, um, it's very easy to say, hey, if this artist um, is touring this year, it's going to be a great year. When I first started looking at the company, um, maybe 15 years ago, it was U2. U2's been replaced with Taylor Swift as that mega event and that mega marquee talent. Um, so I, I think there's always one. But when you look at the portfolio that Live Nation has and you look at who's touring this year, it's a very diverse group. So while they may not have the top talent touring this year, they have some superior talent um, on the books. Bad Bunny is touring, Drake, Nicki Minaj, Aerosmith, Billy Joel. So Tim McGraw, you just look at who's coming out this year. There's a lot of solid uh tours that they're bringing on tap in a very diverse group. So maybe it's not as quite as splashy with the big stadium um, events, but I think it'll be a solid year nonetheless. So two random thoughts. One, Beyonce is out with a country song, which is pretty huge, I imagine. Uh, that'll it sparks some interest there. Also, you can still catch you two at the Sphere in Las Vegas, which looks awesome. But, John, I'm taking a look at your notes right now, and you say that live events can't be Amazon. And I think that's such an interesting point because, you know, to Shanali's question, do you need these big stars to bring people out to these live events? I mean, this is something that you can't really replicate, maybe in the metaverse, but that seems quite a long ways off. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's, it is quite a, a ways off. And I really look at Live Nation being a unique, unique name this year because it can't be what I would say double A. It can't be Amazon and it doesn't have affordability issues. Mm. This is not a finance purchase. This is something that is a night out. It's a mini vacation. So from a consumer standpoint, I think the trade, di trade down dynamic with a tighter, tighter pocket, but consumer, um, it actually is to their favor. But again, to your point, Amazon, um, you know, this cannot be replaced, um, you know, via e-commerce. This is a unique live event. And I think what we're finding and, and what you're seeing across the consumer space right now is the live events and experiences are what the consumer values the most. And um, I think anything out of COVID that is what, what's changed with the consumer. And this is the pure play way to benefit um, from that live event. Um, in the consumer silo. Well, to that point, I mean, I feel like the Taylor Swift experience really proved that consumers are willing to pay up to the tune of thousands of dollars if they really want to see an artist, of course. But let's talk a little bit about your rating when it comes to Live Nation. You have a buy rating. $102 is your price target. You take a look at shares after hours, currently trading around $92, $93. What do you think is going to propel it to that price target? What more do we need to see? Well, I think I think with this stock, um, it always ends up in a little bit of a purgatory, um, you know, from what I would say, October through February, where investors are just waiting for signs that the concert season is going to be what they hope it's going to be. Um, so I think what we really need to see is getting into 2024. We got to see them put up good numbers in their amphitheaters, whether it's attendance or just per capita fan spending. Um, so I think it's just got you got to get to the shows happening and them being able to prove to investors that. 2023 wasn't peak because of Taylor Taylor Swift. 2024 is going to be a better year than 23, and we think we can keep this momentum going. So I think they just have to put up some good numbers in Q2. All right, Taylor Swift, she was just the beginning. John Healy over at North Coast Research, really appreciate your time. Now still ahead, what investors need to watch for tomorrow? Coming up, this is Bloomberg. One of the biggest things investors will have their eyes on tomorrow, other than the weekend, of course, is Warner Brothers Discovery. Out with results before the bell. And here to help take us through what to expect is Bloomberg's Chris Palmieri reporting live from L.A. Chris, what should we be keeping an eye out for? Well, right now, this is kind of a transitional quarter for Warner Brothers, as it is a lot of folks in the media business. They're coming off a pretty tough time last year with the strikes in that. Advertising in the TV networks is expected to be down again. 
and so overall revenue will be down. At the same time, this company, as a lot of other folks have, uh, has been cutting costs. Uh, they've been licensing content to other folks and as a way of uh, generating more money from their programs. So we could see a bump in the, in the profits, at least in the earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization part. So, uh, so that could be uh, an upside. Well, if you look at the stock, it's sold off pretty meaningfully over a one-year period. Certainly a lot of challenges for the industry, but for this company, is there more upside or downside at this point? We'll see. I mean, this is a company that's uh, has made some pretty bold moves. Um, we, you know, they had a, three big releases come out in the fourth quarter from a movie standpoint. One of them, Aquaman, did not do so well. So it uh, could be a disappointment on the film studio side. Uh, you know, what, what they say about subscribers is likely to be in focus. It's projected to be up a little bit from the previous quarter, but down for the previous year. And of course, you know, the subscribers to Max, and the, it, that's such a big part of the business today and the future of the business. So look, we'll, we'll be looking for some explanation of what's going on there. And what is the street saying about how they expect Warner Brothers Discovery to stack up against some of its peers? Well, you know, one of the big issues is where, what their next step is. We're coming up on a two-year period now where they could potentially make some more acquisitions. They you know, were spun off AT&T and were sort of prohibited for doing so for tax reasons. Uh, there's been a lot of chatter about a potentially transformative deal, whether it be Paramount Global or uh, another media company. So, um, so that'll likely be a question that comes up uh, on the call from analysts. All right, Bloomberg's Chris Palmieri, all over it. Really appreciate your time. And, of course, one of the other breaking news items that we've been following this afternoon, of course, is that Reddit S1 that was finally filed. And we just learned from the filing that uh, Sam Altman is listed as the third largest Reddit shareholder. Uh, it's going to be interesting, again, to tease out these details from this filing. AI means Reddit meets crypto meets Ethereum. <laughs> There's a lot of synergy here. <laughs> uh, Going to be interesting to digest that headline. But let's look ahead to what else we're watching today. 6.24 p.m. Eastern, Intuitive Machines will attempt to put the first U.S.-made lander on the moon, if that is successful, first in over 50 years. It's certainly a landmark moment. A lot of people who have their eye on the space world, including the U.S. government, have their eyes on this mission. We have a lot more ahead of us as well, though, internationally and the U.S., Katie. Yeah, if you want to wake up early, 2 a.m. Uh, Eastern, we do get the those German GDP numbers. Uh, and then all day, actually, you have the EU finance ministers meeting. Uh, of course, a lot of geopolitical tensions in the world right now, a lot of issues, a lot of heavy topics to discuss. Yeah, especially when President Biden looks to unveil sanctions. Remember, we're thinking a lot about Russia, its place relative to uh, the U.S. allies over in the East. So we'll keep an eye on that as well, as well as a lot more earnings. A lot more earnings, of course, as we discussed. We are awaiting Warner Brothers Discovery. That is coming at 7 a.m. Eastern. But we also have Hyatt. We also have Icon Enterprises to look forward to. And it's a good reminder that even though we're through the bulk of tech earnings, of course, there's still a lot to get through, especially retail next week. It's kind of like a, a lot of the bad news came after the market today. Let's see if we can keep that exuberance after a record high. Yeah, big time. We'll see what propels us next or whether NVIDIA is going to do all the work, of course, as we proceed through earnings season. It's a good question whether it's going to be macro, of course, the Fed, or micro that continues to fuel this index. Yeah, we saw those yields ride higher. Let's see if that matters <laughs> and do another day. Well, that does it for us, though. In the U.S., Balance of Power is up next, all about the politics. But from us, have a great evening. This is Bloomberg.